Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to briefly explain the structure of this webinar. Today, Silvana will be speaking about the new Bell Foundation, Bell Foundation freely available evidence-informed EAL module for ITE providers, which was launched at the beginning of December this year. She'll explore why the Foundation have developed an IT module on EAL, what's in the module, and finally, she'll look at its key design features. If there's time at the end, Silvana will take any questions that you may have. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box as they come to you, and I will collect them and post them to Silvana at the end. Tomorrow, you'll receive an email from us with a link to access the video recording of this webinar. Enough of me now. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Silvana Richardson. Silvana joined the Bell Foundation in 2012 and currently works for the Foundation as Strategic Education Advisor. She is also Head of Education at Bell Educational Services and Academic Director of the Bell Teacher Academy, a summer school for teachers, teacher educators and school leaders from all over the world. She holds an MA in Teacher Education, is PGCE and Delta qualified and has trained teachers, teacher educators and middle and senior school leaders both in the UK and abroad. Silvana has taught in secondary schools, further and higher education institutions and is, pu is a published author and regular speaker at national and international conferences and guest lecturer in initial teacher education programmes. Over to you, Silvana. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, welcome, everybody. It's really, really great to see so many of you. I thought that uh, at the very tail end of the term and of such a difficult year, I will be speaking to myself really and to my colleagues from the foundation. So it's really lovely to see uh, many people joining this afternoon. Um, so this webinar, as uh, Emily mentioned, is about um, a, a new module we have just launched, which is free to download. And it is about English as an additional language for um, initial teacher education providers. And it's called Understanding EAL. So, before we get um, started, I would like to um, know a little bit more about you. So it would be great if you could um, type in the chat box which IT institution you work for, if you work in initial teacher education, either schools-based or university-based. And um, so just type one and the name of your setting, and then two, why you have chosen to attend this webinar. Why are you interested in, in this webinar? Thank you. So I'll be reading from the chat box. We've got people from Oxford Brooks, from Plymouth, so different parts of the country, North Wiltshire, Edinburgh, Napier, the Shire Foundation here, not far away from here, from, here, from Luton, Canterbury, Sussex. Lovely, fantastic. Quite, quite a range from all over the country. Liverpool Hope, Ripley, uh, Connect Teaching School, our partners, University of Birmingham. Fantastic. So. Um, I was just wondering, sharing the module with our students, um, fantastic. I'm looking now at the reasons why you have decided to attend this webinar. Um, although the information comes a bit mixed, so we're still here um, from Bath and Wales and Great Manchester, the sunny suburbs. Ooh, can I have a little bit of that, please? Um, Surrey, more Surrey. Uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, wow. Stockport, to explore ways of improving our provision. I train trainee teachers on EAL. You're in the right place, Linda. Thank you. Um, I wanted to learn what resource to provide so, uh, support. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. I have a, now, now a, a better sense of um, who we are you know, talking and interacting with. London, fantastic. OK, so um, just a reminder again that um, I'll be talking about modules that have been specially designed for the training of initial teacher education trainees, i.e. people who are considering and are training to become teachers. Um, so in this session, first of all, I'm going to tell you why at the foundation we have decided to design new um, ITE modules on English as an additional language. Then I'm going to be telling you what is, what's the content, what's in the Understanding EAL module, which is the new module that we have just launched. I'll be telling you a little bit about the design features and hopefully, if there is time, um, there will be some time for questions and answers. 
So let's get started with the first point. Why new IT modules on EAL? So um, we have been thinking about this for a while at the Bell Foundation, uh, mainly because of three reasons. So let me just first name the reasons and then I'll tell you a little bit about them. So number one, the increasing diversity that we find in, in many schools all over the country. Uh, Number two, research findings, uh, findings from a study that we commissioned at the Bell Foundation and that was published two years ago on IT in EAL. And finally, the launch of the ITT core content framework uh, almost, well, over a year ago now. So, um, increasing diversity. If you look at the number of pupils with English as an additional language in England, and if we look particularly at the figures from 2020, you will notice that the proportions of learners with English as an additional uh, language in schools continue to rise. Um, so the number for this year was over 1,600,000 pupils were uh, classed as having English as an additional language, and that is 19.5, almost 20% of um, the school population. So this means, as I said, almost one in five of all pupils in schools are from uh, backgrounds that are culturally and linguistically diverse. If we look at uh, this from the point of view of teachers, um, nearly half of all the teachers in England will be teaching pupils from diverse backgrounds and 25% of teachers work in classrooms where at least 10% of the pupils use a first language that is different from English, the language of instruction. This data comes from the Tally survey from 2019. Unfortunately, we don't have any data from 2020 because the UK uh, did not uh, participate in the survey. Um, back in May, um, we did a webinar um, with Dr. Jean Conte here at the Bell Foundation, and um, she gave us some um, an explanation of or tried to look at British society in 2020 behind the figure. So what's going on? And one of the interesting developments is that migration is no longer a reason for the continuing increase in numbers. So what we see is that learners with English as an additional language are not on the whole migrants themselves, but they are born in the UK. Many of them are British citizens and some uh, their the mothers as well are the parents are not are, are not sorry, are not born abroad, so they're born in the UK as well. We also find that schools are increasingly multilingual spaces, so this, although this sometimes is a little bit hidden uh, because of, you know, curriculum. And uh, we also find that teachers are much, uh, much more commonly live lives in diversity in the cities and towns where they live and are from diverse backgrounds themselves. So we find a society that's uh, diverse, that's multilingual, and Basically, schools reflect that society. So as uh, Professor Kostan Lung said, ethno-linguistic diversity and English as an additional language can now be fairly regarded as ordinary and permanent features of schooling education. So this super diversity is now the norm in the UK rather than, you know, something to look at as an exception or something that's just marginal to society. So um, at the Bell Foundation, we believe that ensuring that student teachers as they start their training and their professional development as future teachers, it's really important that to ensure that they're adequately prepared to work with increasingly complex school populations and to meet the needs of pupils from diverse backgrounds as part of their initial teacher education. This is essential, not just because of the numbers, but also due to the need to ensure that they're teaching practices and behaviors and values and attitudes that fully reflective of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, if we look at uh, research findings, um, as I said, back in 2018, the Bell Foundation published a research study called EAL in ITE, uh, uh, authored by uh, Dr. Yvonne Foley and a team of researchers. And the focus of this research was to gather both student teachers and teacher education, uh, educators' perceptions of the extent to which initial teacher education programs in England 
prepare beginning teachers to meet the language and the literacy needs of pupils learning English as an additional language. I won't bore you with the detail of the methodology, but it's there if you want to know. But basically, very quickly, um, there was data collection midway through the study and at the end of the study. And um, one of the most important findings among many was um, the perception from student teachers and their reporting uh, feelings of uh, being de-skilled and disempowered um, as they support the learning of pupils uh, for whom English is an additional language. And here is a quote uh, from the study. And interestingly, it doesn't just talk about trainees or student teachers. It says many student teachers and teacher educators across the teacher preparation route. So it doesn't matter whether it's university based or school based. This happened across the board. Feel that they lack confidence and experience as they work to address pupils' needs within linguistically and culturally diverse settings. And um, here's a quote um, from uh, one of the participants in the study, a student teacher in a PGCE primary route. And she basically said uh, that she thought that more needed to be done to support new teachers. And I read uh, her quote. She says, I realize it is difficult to fit in all of the theory in the limited time we spend at university in courses. But I really feel learning more about how to meet the needs of EAL children is essential in an increasingly cosmopolitan country. And we do agree with this uh, completely. Um, so I just wanted, before I move on, I'll tell you more about the modules that we have designed. Um, I wanted to know whether you feel that the findings that I've just told you about resonate with your own experiences as an IT provider or not, and if so, how? So um, if I can um, get your opinions and views for a, for a minute or two, that would be really interesting. Lack of experience, yes, the problem in our region. Uh, interesting, uh, somebody was saying that she works uh, with the experienced EAL teachers and they feel the same. I would agree that it feels disempowering as a student teacher to try to support without prior knowledge or specialist approach. We touch on this, but we only have time. Time is a massive problem, isn't it? Because there's so much to, if you like, to pack in very busy teacher education programs that sometimes, you know, um, and this appeared in the study as well, the grand total was just an hour of, of training on EAL. Very much so, especially as we have lots of mid-phase submissions. Um, just joined, have done, na, na, na. hard to get the support, yes. Very happy, that's great. School placements are working in an area of lower yeah, linguistic diversity. OK, so I think um, pretty much there is consensus so far. Again, the question of time and not enough time to explore and model. Yes, OK, well, thank you very much for your views. I just want wondering whether that resonated or not. So thank you. So I will now um, move on and tell you that in that study um, conducted by uh, Dr. Foley uh, and, and her colleagues, uh, they provided recommendations for teacher education providers and policy makers. And also, as part of the research, they designed and piloted EAL in IT professional development resources back in 2018. So I really recommend, if you can, that you download, if you're interested in the topic, this study. Um, from the Bell Foundation website. Um, the, the thing was that back in 2018, when this was published, um, the recommendations were before uh, produced um, before uh, the launch of the um, um, core content framework for ITT. So we felt in the foundation that we, once the uh, core content framework was published, that we needed to look back at those professional development resources and kind of repurpose them and review them in the light of the core content framework. So let's look now at the ITT core content framework. 
I'm sure you're very familiar with it if you're an IT provider. This was launched over a year ago in November 2019. And as you know, the core content framework is very clear um, in saying that it specifies the minimum entitlement of all trainee teachers. And it hastens to add that is not the a curriculum, but it's the the core minimum and therefore it gives freedom to providers to design you know curricula that is appropriate uh, for their trainees in their contexts and settings as you well know as well uh, the ITT core content framework only provides general statements across the board so it makes absolutely no reference to specific groups of pupils faces and stages and the assumption of course is that these apply to all pupils in all settings and that they encapsulate quality teaching for all sorry to interrupt Emily there's a requirement if we can um, provide a URL for the study if you're so kind thank you um, now the interesting thing going back uh, to the ITT core content framework because of what I've said that generic statements they encapsulate quality teaching for all that it does not specify distinctive approaches for specific groups so for example there is absolutely no distinctive recommendations for pupils with English as an additional language and in terms of the bibliography and the resources that it includes there is only one reference uh, and quite old actually from uh, 2010 and about one specific aspect of the core content framework which is the relationship between you know high expectations and teacher expectations and the achievement of learners uh, in the teaching of English as interestingly as a foreign language which is not necessarily the same content sorry context as English as an additional language um, but more interestingly the teacher standards remain the criteria for assessment and not the statements in the core content framework more about this in a minute this relationship so back in may when dr conte was um our guest and and um leading a webinar um she viewed uh, the not explicit mention not not mentioning explicitly eal in the core content framework as an opportunity and she said back then that the fact that eal is not singled out as a separate issue in the core content framework can be taken as a positive reflection of the process this process that I was talking about of uh, super diversity becoming the norm in the UK um, so it shows that EAL needs to be regarded as normal and even a central part of school life and of teachers trainees experience and nobody would disagree with that having said that the flip side of that is that there's also a risk here um, the invisibility of specific differences and this is a comment from again from Professor Constant Lung who says that a common curriculum flattens difference and promotes the politics of universalism where individual or group differences are not recognized another point to be made here is that as I said on the one hand we've got the ITT core content framework um, statements and descriptors which um, outline generic content and on the other hand as I mentioned before the teacher standards remain the assessment criteria now you may I'm sure you know this very well I would probably test if I tested you you would be able to uh, recite all the statements by heart um, in section 5 um, which is about adapting teaching to respond to the strengths and needs of all pupils it says have a clear understanding of the needs of all pupils including those with EAL and more importantly listen to this be able to use and evaluate distinctive teaching approaches to engage and support them so we've got this tension there between those generic statements in the core content framework and the expectation that that, that trainees trainee teachers student teachers should be able to um, to work with specific teaching approaches to meet the needs of children with English as an additional language for this reason back in April well actually first few days of May at the Bell Foundation we launched a document and um, which you can download again for free which was called designing new IT curricula EAL content recommendations because we felt that we needed to flesh out those uh, and supplement those statements from the core content framework 
and kind of spell out what they meant for pupils for whom English was or is an additional language. Um, so these are evidence-informed content recommendations. They follow the structure of the core content framework and the teacher standards to make it easy to read and follow. But we also provided many more references and further reading related to English as an additional language to help um, IT providers and tutors who are writing the new curricula back, back at the start of this year. So a very quick um, slide to show you how we structured this document. So we've got the minimum content, enti content entitlement um, as stated in the IT core content framework. We've got the assessment standards again that feature in the teacher standard sections and then we added um, the EAL related content. So what we thought student teachers needed to learn in relation to English as an additional language in initial teacher education programs. And this, I'm sure that's very familiar to you because again, it echoes the structure of the ITT core content framework. We've got learn that statements and learn how to statements echoing that structure. This, of course, as I said, was to ensure that EAL content fits with the core content framework and enhances it and it kind of visualizes for IT uh, tutors and providers, you know, what the EAL aspect of the core content framework was. Um, so we come to the EAL modules. Um, the first thing to say is that the content is based on those EAL content recommendations document that we launched back in May, that they incorporate whenever possible relevant professional re development resources that were designed by the originally by the research team in the 2018 study where appropriate, as I said. We have just launched the understanding EAL module which became available to download for free from the Bell Foundation uh, on the 1st of December 2020 and there are more modules to come in 2021. So let's look at the modules, well, this module. What is in the um, Understanding EAL module? Um, before I begin this section, I just wanted to say that in the research uh, study by Foley and her colleagues, they recommended, as part of the recommendations, they recommended a dual approach, whereby um, in teacher education programs, a number of sessions should give a grounding in knowledge and strategies for working with learners who use English as an additional language. But they said that the bulk of the input and requirements for reflection and action in the ITE program should be infused throughout individual subjects and across all core concerns of an ITE program. So in other words, the EAL should permeate um, whatever else you teach. So for example, if, when, if and when you cover differentiation or adaptive teaching now, well, what about adapting teaching for pupils with EAL. When you deal with feedback, how can we give feedback effectively for pupils with English as an additional language at different, you know, proficiency in English bands, for example. When you work in assessment, what, what considerations need to be taken into account when we work with pupils with English as an additional language, etc., etc. So there's a permeation across all the topics. Um, so as uh, Foley et al. Um, say or state that the focus here is on making all lessons accessible rather than treating EAL as a bolt on addition. So again, we have this idea of mainstreaming and normalizing diversity rather than thinking of EAL as something else or something on the border, um, on the borders. Um, so our understanding EAL module really is about this first recommendation. So it's it's to be used by IT providers in if you if you um, deliver a session or a number of sessions where you talk about or, or cover English as an additional language. Um, in terms of the content, um, as I said, is linked to the core content framework section three and the teacher standards section three. And if you look at the recommendations in our document, it would be our section three. I'm not gonna um, talk so that you can read that now. I'm gonna let you read that for a second about the content it covers.
And also, um, you will see that it briefly introduces content from the core content framework section three and our supplementation, if you like, around EAL. So have a look and read for a second. Okay, so uh, we have divided the content of this module into six areas. So we're still talking about one module, but the module in includes, if you like, six different content areas. Number one, why focus on EAL? Sometimes we do need to make this explicit, why we're talking about EAL. Um, defining EAL, so we look at, for example, the original definition, how that definition is problematic, etc. Um, the notion of super diversity of the EAL population, the relationship between EAL and attainment, the, attain the educational attainment of pupils who use English as an additional language and the variation factors in that attainment. We look at the policy in England with respect to English as an additional language. And finally, um, we look at uh, an inclusive pedagogy of EAL in multilingual classrooms. And even though I have um, listed six sections, I would say that uh, the first five take 50% of the content and number six takes the other 50% because it's, you know, after all, our student teachers are practitioners or training to be practitioners. So we really wanted to make sure that the inclusive pedagogy had an important place. Uh, but of course, the content is also the context and their understanding of the context and the policy and the research is also important. And I, I want to remind you that we will be writing further modules and launching further modules next year where we do look at specific aspects of pedagogy in more depth. So what is there in terms of types of materials? So first of all, um, there are PowerPoint slides for the tutors to use. There are also MP4 video files for the sessions, but also video tutorials for the IT tutors that talk you through a little bit of what I'm doing now. Tell you, um, you know, what, what's in the modules, what the design features are, etc. Um, there are also resources for the student teachers. So there are handouts uh, for pre and post reading with activities. There are worksheets uh, for this, the sessions and there are also session plans to accompany the materials for IT tutors. So let's look at the design features now in a little bit more depth. So the first thing I think this is good news to be said is that we have designed two different versions. So first of all we designed a short one hour session materials for a short one hour session. And we also designed materials for a longer three hour session. These are materials uh, that to be used by the IT tutors themselves. So uh, they're pretty much ready to go. And we created two different versions uh, to cater for different needs, different priorities and different constraints of different ITT settings. Because we know from experience of working in different IT settings that you know there is more time or less time. So we wanted to make sure that we catered for everybody there. The other thing to say is that we made sure that our materials including, included uh, the two different types of provision, knowing what we now know about the pandemic and um, lockdown and remote teaching, etc. So we have designed materials and suggestions for face-to-face -face teaching and for online teaching as well. So uh, how are these materials different? Well, we've designed different materials for face-to-face -face and online when this was necessary, but we also included recommendations in the lesson plans. So here is an example of a face-to-face -face option versus an online option. So on the left, you can see it's the same activity, absolutely the same activity. It's a Diamond 9 activity where student teachers look 
at a number of, um, this is part of the pedagogy section, and it's about demonstrating inclusive attitudes. So it's about behaviors that demonstrate um, inclusive attitudes. So um, trainees have got to look at uh, cards and they've got to decide, you know, which they feel they're easiest to implement in their settings or most, most difficult, etc. In the face-to-face -face option, as you can see, th these are cards that uh, IT providers should need to uh, print out, cut up if you want laminate, put in envelopes and, uh, you know, give a set to each group and then uh, participants work in groups. In the online option, it's exactly the same cards, but the, different is, the difference is that we have provided PowerPoint presentations so that um, the IT trainees can go into different breakout rooms and they can uh, digitally drag and drop the cards as part of their discussion in the breakout rooms. As I said, it's not just materials that we have designed uh, to cater for online and face-to-face -face settings, but we also included, uh, there were many possibilities, uh, many moments where it was perfectly okay to use the same material, but to offer different recommendations or suggestions about how to use them. So this is, a, for example, an activity which is a quick poll uh, to engage um, student teachers at the start of the session. Um, and in the, in the session plan, uh, we include different recommendations. So the slide can be used, the poll can be used in exactly the same way, but you know, for online, for example, we recommend asking the student teachers to enter the suggestion in the poll. If you have a poll, if not on the chat box, if there is no poll, in the face-to-face -face, um, session, um, you know, we invite IT providers to consider how to conduct the poll and provide a couple of suggestions. So, for example, raising hands or student teachers writing their letter on a mini whiteboard and reveal it at the count of three, etc. So, as you can see, it's the same activity with suggestions for how to conduct, to conduct them either face-to-face -face or online. The other important thing to say is that we have dis divided, if you like, the content uh, into different types. So first, we have, we have classified the content into core content, supplementary content, editable content, and phase-specific options. This is to offer flexibility for different priorities, preferences, and constraints of different IT providers. So, um, this is an example of a core and a supplementary act, uh, activity. So, this is, for example, the slide that is the feedback on the poll that you've seen before. So, we recommend as core content um, the slide that you see on the left where there's absolutely no highlight of any color. And then the supplementary content, content as you see, has got pink highlight and this is the code for this is supplementary content so if you look at the left you only have general the general number of pupils with English as an additional language but if you want to go in more depth you see in the slide on the right the numbers in detail so you see the numbers for nursery primary schools, secondary schools, special schools, and pupil referral units. So it's up to you whether you want to go just at the level of general numbers or you want to drill into more detail. Here is another example, um, and this is an example of a slide that looks at, uh, presents uh, the overall findings around proficiency in English and educational attainment. And then again, there are a number of supplementary content slides, again, with pink highlights. So where you see the overall information on the left in number one, if you look at number two A, you will see the subject detail. These are slides about English, and you see further detail by stages. So if you look at the columns, you see early years, year one, key stage one, key stage two, GCSE, and then you see the different levels of proficiency for each of those phases and stages. <clears throat> Going on with the same, um, more phase-specific options. So you've got the same data, but in slide B for early years, in C for key stage one, D for key stage two SATs, and E for key stage four GCSE. So you see two types of highlights there. Pink, remember, supplementary content, and yellow, this is a phase-specific piece of information. 
The other thing that I said is that we also created editable content. And this is um, really to make sure that you have as much information at your fingertips as possible, but that you can make decisions around what is useful for your context. So for example, if you look at this slide, this is about EAL learners in your region, but in fact, you've got every region in England. Um, so. Um, and it's highlighted in blue. So blue highlight is code for this is an editable slide. So for example, if you are like I am based in the East of England, you probably want to include just the East of English data and you want to delete everything else. Also we included slides like this where we invite you if you want to add um, more data, it's kind of drill it down even further. So for example, in East of England, this could be a Luton slide, um, you know, about EAL pupils in your setting and that you type the name of your age. And we've got prompts there, type the name of your area, fill in with current data about your student teacher setting. It could be local authority level, it could be even school level if you have that information. So if you want to edit these editable slides, to make the content relevant to your student teacher's contexts, all you need to do is to deselect the highlights. This also, of course, applies to the supplementary content as well and the face, you know, the, the pink and the yellow. Delete any unnecessary information that doesn't apply to your context and add information as appropriate to your context. As I said, your local authority data, your school data, etc. Now, what this actually means is that you have to make some decisions and you do have to prepare to use this material. I would say rest assured that the content has been carefully selected. We spent quite a lot of time trying to think of what was relevant um, and all the materials have been quality assured. Uh, and that slides, therefore, are ready to be used with minimum adaptation, minimal adaptation. However, it's really important to put across this idea that decisions need to be made by you, the IT provider, about supplementary content and that some content needs editing for relevance to your context. So you really, before you, you it's not something that you can pick up five minutes before doing a session. I'm, I'm not suggesting for a minute that you do that, but you know, it, uh, you do need some careful, t some time for careful reading and editing before you use uh, these materials. Um, now let's look at the pedagogy. So we tried to make sure that there was some material before the session, for during the session, and for after the session. So let's look at before the session. So the approach here is flipped learning. So we provided pre-reading activities before the session to make sure that some of the content was already dealt with before the actual session to prepare student teachers for activities during the live session, either face to face or online. So let me show you an example. <clears throat> this is a pre reading activity uh, for section four of the module, which is the relationship between EAL and attainment and variation factors. So um, this is, uh, as I said, a hand, um, a worksheet, a pre reading activity. Um, and it uh, asks, well, it talks about vignettes. So the following vignettes give an insight into some of the factors that affect the attainment of students in secondary education who speak English as an additional language. And uh, we ask student teachers to read each vignette and make notes. So it's not just passive reading. Uh, make notes on the challenges and opportunities facing each of the learners in the vignettes using prompts, which are included after each vignette to help direct your ideas. There's also a worked example. The first vignette has been done for you. An example, there's also a reminder of um, that during the training session, they will be asked to discuss the ideas with the, the ideas from this um, activity with other trainees. As I, as I said before, that there's also a primary um, phase specific option available. So this is an example of the vignette. Um, I don't expect you to read everything. Just to show you is examples typ of typical learners with EAL um, on the left. And on the right, we've got um, some pointers to uh, um, help um, our student teachers think about specific aspects that are relevant to that vignette. And then um, 
as I said, see, here are more vignettes, and those are the reflection activities on the right, which model darts directed activities related to text. This is something that you can also point out to the trainees that uh, we have made sure that we included um, some material that demonstrates good practice in English as an additional language. And the second task is using the notes, then completing the sections for the vignettes on the table. So it's about opportunities and challenges. And again, there's another worked example. So it's, it's a way of flipping the learning before participants come into the sessions. Let's look at during the session now. We have tried as much as we possibly could to loosely follow um, Angie Mandres and Martin Weddle's framework for planning lessons. Now, we couldn't fit it in absolutely everywhere. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in a second. Um, but I think uh, we managed to do a better job of this with a three hour session just because we had more time. So there is a little bit of this in the hour session, but we were constrained. So uh, Madras and Weddle talk about four stages. Number one, begin with experience. Number two, get out. Number three, put in Number four, end with experience. Memorable names, so memorable stages. Let me talk the, uh, you through very quickly uh, what each is. So they suggest that uh, when training uh, teachers, it's a good idea to begin with experience. And by experience, they mean relating to the topic, the topic of the session, in this case EAL, to the student teacher's experiences. And when we say experiences here, we mean their experiences as learners in schools, as citizens in a city or in a town or in a community, as uh, trainees in uh, an IT program, as student teachers as well in a placement setting, etc. So tap into the different dimensions, if you like, of experience. The second stage, Get Out, is about helping student teachers articulate what they already know and think about the topic and to help them co-construct together their own concepts and ideas linked to what they already know. Um, stage three, put in, is about this is where we present new content uh, and we, in the process of presenting new co content, we support student teachers to make personal sense of that input. Um, really make it meaningful to them and their context. And finally, end with experience, um, is about linking the learning in the session with their own practice and their own observations and their own settings and um, to give them opportunities to practice or implement what they have learned and consider practical implications and application for their classroom. So let me show you an example, a couple of examples from the different stages. So this is an example from a begin with experience activity. This is uh, section three of the module. Um, so the section on super diversity. And we see here in this resource, um, first of all, just a reminder to them, um, even in the introduction, why we're focusing on super diversity, that they will be very familiar with the different dimensions of such diversity. Then we, we ask trainees to work in groups of four participants and to make a list of all the possible dimensions of diversity that they can come up with that need to be taken into account when working with learners with EAL. And look here at the explicit appeal to their experience. Make sure you tap into your own experiences as you contribute to the list. And here it explicitly mentions the different dimensions. So perhaps a former pupils or students in diverse British schools or colleges or universities or as pupils with EAL yourselves as members of a diverse multicultural community, as student teachers in placement schools, blah, blah, blah. The get out here comes with them sharing the list with the rest of the wider group, listening to what the other groups share, and as they listen to check if the other groups have identified further dimensions that they had not included in their list, and if so, at them. So here again, we see active listening and a kind of co-constructed moment of peer learning, Listen, learning from and with each other. Then comes um, input in the form of a text. Um, more about this in a minute. And the task is to get the trainees to read the list of dimensions of super diversity 
and to highlight any dimensions that have not been discussed either in their group or identified by other groups in the previous task. So again, this is not just reading, but it's active reading. And this is the example of the text. Of course, in the, in the handout, it looks much better. We're just um, putting it all together here for you to see. I don't expect it to read it, you to read it now. But first of all, a quick comment. This is evidence informed. This has been drawn, content drawn from um, uh, the recently published uh, volume by Evans et al on EAL and um, the research report by Anderson et al. And as you can see, just by looking at the number of bullet points, the idea here is to broaden and to challenge the existing perspectives about diversity, not just about languages that they speak or countries that they come from. But it kind of tries to really zoom out and look at many other different dimensions of that super diversity. And therefore, at the end, we end with experience, so some discussion questions that help them think about the impact of these dimensions on the achievement of pupils. So link the content back with their experience in the placement schools. Oh, somebody says, it looks great. Thank you very much, Anne. That's very uh, rewarding. Um, OK, so moving on to after the session. Um, again, so there is some consolidation and further input um, through post-session activity handout. So again, it's not just passive reading, but task-based. So here's an example. This is an example from uh, Section 5 policy, and it's a handout uh, where, uh, part, uh, where trainee teachers are invited to read a brief summary of current government policy in relation to EAL learners and to think about the placement school and consider how government policy is being implemented in the school you're currently placed and in your experience and from your observations what is the actual impact of government policy on the lives of EAL learners, the teachers, other learners and the school as a whole. So as you can see there's a link back to their settings. That's the text. And a couple more comments on the slides. So these, I'm talking about the slides for the tutors here. And we have been very careful in trying to select slides that made your life easier. Um, so we have designed different slide uh, layouts. But before I tell you a little bit about the different slide layouts, just a word on accessibility. So we have checked all colors and all fonts for accessibility. They're, not, they're all uh, sans serif and they're all accessible colors. And as I said, we created different slide designs for different types of session activity or for different types of stage in the session so that you as a tutor know exactly where you are just by looking at the slide uh, without having to read too much in the middle of the session. So, as you can see, <laughs> this wide, with this white slide with a blue title is an information slide. And here you will find mediated content. More about this in a minute. This is an example, for example. Then there are orange slides, and these orange slides are activity slides. What will you find here? You will find instructions for the activity step by step. Now, why? Because what we try to do is model good practice in material design for pupils with EAL. So we do want to give pupils with English as an additional language um, some kind of um, scaffolding in the instructions, and that's why we kind of mimic that um, in our IT slides. Um, here you will see patterns of grouping or typo activity. So, for example, um, you will see icons like that. Um, well, you know, so that just by looking at that quick, quickly at that picture, you know where you are. You know, this is an activity that requires them to work in pairs or in small groups or to vote in a poll or to read or to write or to listen or to watch a video or time for reflection. This is an example of an activity slide. That's a vignette. And very quickly, orange activity, two people talking. This is work in pairs. Uh, green means feedback. So here in the green slides, you will find suggested key points that could be made if you want it at the end of activities. And this is where input 
can be provided following student teachers discussion or exploration during activities of course in addition to the points that you will want to make um, that will depend on the discussion that emerges during the session this is an example of an information slide at the end of an activity and this obviously is a signpost slide um, so this is a, the, the kind of slide that we put as a divider between stages which is a reminder for trainees so the, the arrow on the left points to the sec the section uh, or the stage that we have just finished or the content we have just covered and the, the arrow on the right points to the section or the stage that's coming next so this is an example of a support signpost slide just an, a very quick comment about information slides. We have tried to make sure as much as we possibly could that the content was evidence informed, but also we say that the content in our materials is mediated. So what, what do we mean by this? Well, um, we do try to include a lot of uh, research evidence. However, as I'm sure you're aware, the uh, target, the main target for research is academic. So academics write research for their colleagues or for policymakers, and um, therefore they're written in a language that's accessible and relevant to academics and policymakers, and less so, much less so, to practitioners. This is why um, we mediate uh, that content in our slides to make sure that our materials act as an intermediate, an intermediary between uh, the researchers and practitioners. So this is an example, as you can see, of a mediated content slide that helps you tell your story. I love that comment. Lots of white men on the <laughs> on the researchers. Okay, uh, mediation strategies used. So, um, what mediation strategies have we used in our content? Well, first of all, we uh, streamlined dense texts, in particularly in presentation slides. Uh, we try to break down complicated information, and we try to represent information visually. So just to give you an example, um, you know, the one at the top is a very dense uh, text and it's a little bit like a script. Uh, the second one at the bottom is more akin to the content that you will find in our slides, unless it's a quote, of course, uh, which acts more like a prompt that allows you to speak. And this is really important because it's... Um, Basically, when you look at a slide, your first, uh, your first desire, if you like, or you're tempted to read it, which kind of puts you off from listening to what the presenter is doing. So that's why it's important to include content in such a way that allows you to tell the story rather than just to um, you know, use it as a script, as I said, unless it's, it's a quote. Um, this is an example of how we broke down information or represented visually. This is an, an example of how um, um, a local authority has represented the old DFE EAL proficiency scales, and this is how we've chosen to represent it. Um, you know, the idea of um, a scale <laughs> of a ladder uh, with a lower level at the bottom and the higher level at the top, echoing new to English, early acquisition, etc., and then, uh, you know, just focusing on one specific band there. So as I see, as you can see, it's kind of broken down. Then there will be a similar slide for band B, C, etc. And again, represented visually. Uh, finally, tasks. Why have we, uh, what, what, what kind of activities do we have? Well, we want to, um, to challenge student teachers' perspectives, and that's what we aimed to do through the activities, but also to offer opportunities to expand their knowledge, to deepen their critical thinking and understanding, to do things like analyze and synthesize and prioritize and link, you know, practice with theory and their content, uh, the content that they're looking at with their context, et cetera, et cetera, to apply and implement what they're learning and to evaluate basically usefulness, relevance, effectiveness, impact, et cetera. That's our purpose. Um, I'm not going to do this because we are running out of time. There was a bonus activity just in case, but uh, we're running out of time and I'd much rather we focused on uh, questions and answers. So Emily, I've seen uh, you've been saying a number of times, I'll ask Silvana at the end, but before uh, there's a slide missing here, unfortunately, which was about how to um, 
how to access the um, the materials and basically what you need to do is to write at information at bellfoundation.org.uk uh, Charlie or Emily can I ask you to type the uh, email address um, of that that people if they want to access the materials um, they will need to to access them from and uh, we will give you access to a Moodle um, course where it's not just it's not a course basically it's a, a content management system where you find the folders with the one hour materials and the three hour materials you will find videos for IT uh, providers that explain how to use the materials and before you um, before you download the materials you will be asked to give us a little bit of information to help us understand uh, where you're based and how many trainees you're reaching and we will also thank you Charlie as um, so as I say the uh, email address is info at bell sl um, slash found sorry not slash dash foundation dot org dot uk and um, yeah you will you will be asked to agree to a number of things to make sure um, as, I don't know if you know, we are a charity, so to make sure that the materials are used for the charitable purposes that um, are the, our mission and um, our core activity. So I'm going to shut up. There's time for probably one question, Emily. Sorry about that. Hi, Silvana. Thank you so much for a really informative uh, webinar. Um, yes, quite a few questions. Um, the, the, the one I'll ask you first is um, somebody asked... Um, can we download the ITE module if we're not in higher education? So they're available free to download to institutions that are higher education or SKIDS. So schools, uh, schools based uh, provide IT providers in Great, thank the you. UK. Um, somebody else asked, where can we find the understanding EAL module? Well, that's exactly what I've just explained. <laughs> so uh, right at info at bell-foundation.org.uk and we will get in touch with you and we will provide you uh, access to the Moodle Great, thank course. You. Um, and another, one other question from uh, R. Morrison was, um, so this is about when you mentioned active and di dialogic learning. You mentioned that the module follows um, mm -hmm. Mal Malderes and Wed Weddell's framework for planning sessions and um, R. Morrison wants to know, does this theory only apply to student teachers and not pupils themselves? Well, this is for, it's called, it comes from a publication uh, that's called uh, Training Teachers, no, sorry, Teaching Teachers, Processes and Practices. So it, uh, it basically is for, uh, for trainees and teach, for the teaching of teachers, the teacher learning. I don't see why you couldn't adapt it for teaching Great, students. thank you. Um, and um, I think we'll, I'll ask one more question and then we'll we'll close. Um, and that this is the one is from uh, Kat who says, do you have an assessment to place students within this scale? And I think that was um, just on the last thing that you were talking about just before. Presumably you don't talk about ITE uh, trainees, is that right? Presumably you're talking about students. Yes, uh, Kat, that's right. Kat, your yeah, name? Is that the name? Kat. Is that what you're yes. thinking? So I'm she's typing. Um, yes, the ALL is good. Yeah, so um, what we have at the foundation is something called the Bell Foundation EAL Assessment for Schools. And it has been, again, it's evidence informed, award winning, and it's free to download from the Bell Foundation website. So you will, have, you will find the scales in detail there. There's also materials uh, uh, for its use, like we've got, for example, a tracker which allows you to use um, those um, descriptors in the framework uh, to, to gather data and record data from your learners and generate Perfect. reports. Thank you so much, Silvana. Thank you for a very um, engaging and um, informative webinar. Okay. Thank so you. I'm going Thank to uh, round up now. Um, before we close the webinar, I just wanted to remind you that you'll get an email tomorrow with a link to a video recording of this webinar and a survey. And I also have a couple of announcements to make that might be of interest to you. So the first is that our next webinar will be on uh, January the 13th, and it will focus on using formative assessment of proficiency in English to help learners 
who use English as an additional language catch up and it will look at some practical ways of approaching that and that will be with uh, me. Um, we also uh, recently have developed some new courses which uh, are tailored for an international context. Um, so the first of these is running in January alongside our existing UK based courses. Uh, both of the UK and the international courses running in January focus on assessing language proficiency of learners who use EAL. Um, and you can find out more about both the courses and the upcoming webinar on the Bell Foundation website. And the final announcement is actually about the website, and that is that the website has recently been updated so that all the resources, training and research is in one place. So if you've used EAL Nexus in the past, you might have noticed that that no longer exists but rather has been incorporated into our newly branded Bell Foundation website. So you'll find the resources that were on Nexus are now under the resources section on the Bell Foundation website. So do have a look around there. Thank you very much for taking part in today's webinar. Thank you once again to Silvana, and we look forward to seeing you next year. So we'll stop recording now and end the meeting.